Hello and welcome to yet another tutorial by Davies Media Design. My name is Michael Davies and in today's tutorial I'll be showing you guys what's new in GIMP 2.10.10. In this tutorial, I'll show you all of the new features that have rolled out with this latest release version of GIMP, including on-canvas layer selection, a few key updates made to the transform tools, the long-awaited smart colorization feature, and the first steps towards non-destructive image editing in GIMP, and much more. But of course, before we get into that, I wanna direct you guys over to my website at daviesmediadesign.com. As always, we have tons of GIMP video and text tutorials on here, so definitely check that out. You can also enroll in my best-selling GIMP 2.0 10 masterclass from beginner to pro photo editing in GIMP. And you can support our channel and help us grow by becoming a patron on Patreon. And I'll include a link to this as well as all the relevant links from this tutorial in the description of the video. As always, you can download GIMP completely for free from GIMP.org. When you visit the homepage here, you'll see the download button for GIMP 2.10.10 right now or whatever the latest version of GIMP may be. Click that button and that'll take you to the downloads page. If you scroll down a bit, it should automatically recognize your operating system. I recommend going with the direct download here. So here I have the latest version of GIMP opened up on my computer. And the first feature I want to cover that is found in GIMP 2.10.10 is my favorite feature. And that is the on canvas layer selection. So what this allows you to do is to basically find any layer that you might be working on within your composition easily with one shortcut key. So if I come over here to a composition with tons of layers, tons of layer groups, this was my isometric building that I designed in one of my recent tutorials. I'll go ahead and link that in the the description. But let's say I created this a long time ago and I wanted to select one of the random layers from this composition. I wanted to figure out where it was located so I could edit it for whatever reason. The old way of doing this is that I'd have to come down here and click on the drop down menus here and just sort of search through here until I found the item I was looking for. And of course there are these color labels here which kind of help you find some things but it's not quite as easy as this latest feature. So in order to use the on canvas layer selection to find whatever layer your object is on. All you have to do is hold the Alt key and then click the middle button on your mouse and that will show you exactly where that object is located. So in this case, this is on the layer titled Awning Main and it's under here in the Awning group. So that could have taken me forever to find depending on how many layers or layer groups I had. And one thing I wanna point out too with this is when I Alt and click on this like I just did, so that takes me to the layer, but it also will show me what the name of the layer is down here in the title and status bar. So let me click on something else to demonstrate that. I'll alt click, and that's an alt middle click, by the way, on that chimney there. And you can see down here it says layer picked chimney right. So that's just a convenient way to locate layers within compositions that contain many layers and many layer groups. The next new features I wanna highlight are the transform tool updates. And to do that, I'm gonna come over here to another photo. There's actually been quite a few updates made to these transform tools. Some of them are pretty minor and some of them are pretty huge in my opinion. So I'm gonna start over here with the scale tool. And by the way, you guys have noticed probably that I'm using the dark theme today with the color icons. Anyway, I'm gonna click on the scale tool here. And if I come over here and click on my image, before whenever I transform my image, so let's say I click and scale this down, the handles always stayed where they were. So if I hit control and zoomed in a bit, and I wanted to continue scaling this down, I can't see the handles anymore. So it's maybe not a huge deal for some people, depending on the situation, but for other people or other situations, you may really wanna be able to see the handles while you're scaling zoomed in. The feature I wanna highlight here is one called readjust. So if I come over here and click the readjust button, that is going to readjust the position of my handles. So now my handles are right here in plain sight. So I can continue this transformation so I can either scale it from right here or I can come over here and scale it. So pretty much any of these handles over here, these transform handles, you can now click on and you can also click in the center here and move this around. And then let's say now you wanna readjust these handles again, you can just click that readjust button again and those handles will be readjusted. 
So that just makes it a little bit easier to control your transformations, especially when you have to zoom in or out or you're dealing with a very large image. And on the other hand, I can also come over here and you'll see there's actually a chain link icon here now. And this is under the section titled Direction. So usually you have Normal, which is going to just perform transforms the way you guys normally do. Or you have Corrective or Backward, which is going to basically perform the opposite. So if you tell the Scale tool to scale it up, it'll actually do the opposite and scale it down. But if I come over here and link these, what's going to happen if I hold Control and zoom out? And let me hit Reset actually. So remember, I clicked this link icon. What that basically does is it's going to lock you from performing any transformations. And now you can simply click and drag the handles. And this is just allowing you to reposition these handles manually without clicking that readjust button and having those handles readjusted automatically. Now you can manually adjust these handles and that's going to allow you to put the handles wherever you want. And then for example, I can control and zoom in there. Now, if I uncheck this link icon or I unlink this, and then I set this back to normal, it should allow me now to adjust the scaling of this from the handles that I manually created. So I'll hit the reset button there. So pretty much any of the transform tools that require a handle to perform the transformation are going to have that new readjust and manual readjust feature. And those two features are ones I would consider major changes made to GIMP 2.10.10. There are also some minor changes that have been made to the transform tools. So for example, the unified transform tool, which is going to combine multiple transformations into one tool, is now going to default to maintaining the aspect ratio of your image. So I'll come over here and click on the Unified Transform tool. And when I click on here, if I'm going to use the Scale tool within the Unified Transform tool, it's going to maintain the aspect ratio of the image. And you can see over here, the Scale option is now checked off by default. And you can also see that before you had to hold the Shift key to do this, but now it's just going to start with this by default. So if I click and drag and scale this down, you'll see the aspect ratio of my image is maintained the whole time. On the other hand, if I come over here and uncheck that scale option and perform that same action, you can see that I can scale this without maintaining any sort of aspect ratio on this image. So I'll come over here and hit reset and exit out of that. And a quick note here, the scale option is under the constraint section for these tool options. So on that note, the next feature is for the Perspective tool. And I'm going to come over here and click on my Perspective tool. There is now a new option here to constrain the Perspective tool or constrain the handles. This was not available in earlier versions of GIMP. So now if I come over here and click on my composition, that's going to bring up my handles here. And usually I can just sit here and adjust the perspective of my main image layer. And you'll see that nothing is constraining this, so it's just randomly moving around. Well, if I come over here and check this option, now what's going to happen when I try to transform this is it's going to remain pretty much a straight line on whatever axis you're dragging it on. So you can see that it's sort of snapping right here. So if I move this to the right, it's sort of staying on this diagonal line. So that's just a new feature there for the perspective tool. So I'll come over here and hit reset. And also there is the around center option. So if I check that option and let me uncheck the constraint handles option. Now this is going to allow me to adjust the perspective here of my main image layer around the center of the image layer. And so as you can see, as I change the perspective, it's not moving from the center. So I'll come up here and hit reset and now I'll exit out of this tool. So the next new feature is a highly anticipated one, and this is the line art detection feature or the smart colorization feature. And so I'm gonna come over here to this sketch composition I made, and this is a really rough and terrible sketch of Wilbur that I did. And so the point of doing this sketch is if I hold control and zoom in, you can see there's little gaps here in the sketch or in the shapes that I drew. There's some right here. There's some over here in the eye. And by the way, I sketched this using the My Paintbrush tool and a like charcoal type of brush. So I'm gonna hold control and zoom out. So the main purpose of this new feature is to allow you to easily color in these shapes that may not be entirely closed off without having the colors spill off into the rest of the canvas or the rest of your composition. So if I come over here to the bucket fill tool, I can come down here and check the fill by line art detection option. And that's going to bring up my new line art detection section here. And I'm just going to widen my tool options so we can see all the options here. So for source right here, I'm going to change this to active layer. And I'm going to keep the fill transparent areas option checked, even though we don't really have any transparency over here. 
I'm not going to feather the edges. That's just going to make the edges of the area that I fill with the bucket fill tool a little bit fuzzy, and I don't want to do that for now. And then there's some options here that you can fine tune to get a better result from the algorithm. I'm not super experienced with this tool yet, so I'm not sure what the best settings are here, and I haven't really played around with them too much. But now what I can do is click and drag my bucket fill tool, and you can see that as I do that, instead of having the bucket fill tool filling in every single area of my image, it's now only filling in the areas that it is deeming to be inside of my line art. So in this case, you can see it's stopping right here because it recognizes there's a gap and it's automatically closing that gap off. I'm not really doing the tool justice right now because again, I don't know the proper settings, but I'll come over here and change this color to black now. And for example, I can continue filling in the nose here maybe do the eye right here. So this is just an easy way to color your line artwork and not have to worry about whether or not you've completely closed everything off. And let me also come over here and hide this and unhide the original Wilbur. I can hold the control key and select a color with the bucket fill tool and make sure I'm on the right layer here. And then come back over here to our artwork and again, continue just clicking and dragging this. So this is a feature that definitely has a lot of potential. I did run into a problem with this already while I was testing it out. So I kind of clicked outside of the sketch lines here. And as you can see, it gave me a fatal error. So GIMP didn't really know how to handle that. And it's probably going to shut this down as it did there. But one positive hopefully that can come from this is I can demonstrate GIMP's ability to recover lost and unsafe files. So I'll come over here and reopen GIMP. And now we have our image recovery option. This is something that they've been implementing since a couple of versions ago. I think GIMP 2.10.8 was supposed to have it. It wasn't fully refined in GIMP 2.10.8. So let's see how good of a job it does here. I'll go ahead and click recover. And as you can see, it did recover my line art and it does have all of the fills that I did before. It didn't recover any of my other images though. Although in all fairness, I didn't actually apply any changes to those images. I undid all the changes that I did. All right, so I've gone ahead and opened up all my images again. I'm gonna come back over here to the sketch image. There's actually one more feature I wanna highlight with the bucket fill tool, and that is going to be the ability to fill in areas by clicking and dragging your mouse using the fill similar colors option. So I'll come over here and check the fill similar colors option there. And now if I click and drag my bucket fill tool, it's just going to fill in any area I drag over. And as you can see, any areas that have gaps will cause the bucket fill tool to leak out into the rest of the image. And that's the issue that the fill by line art detection feature is supposed to solve. So hold control Z and undo that. The next new feature applies to the heal and clone tools. And for this, I'm gonna come over here to a new image. And I'm gonna start by coming over here to the heal tool. And I'm gonna change my brush to a normal brush. So now if I scroll down here under the tool options, we have an option for sample merged. This is a brand new feature added in GIMP 2.10.10, and this allows you to sample pixels from a layer below and paint them onto a brand new layer. This is a step closer towards pure non-destructive editing because you're not going to have to apply your heels directly on the layer. You can apply them to a brand new layer and it's not going to affect the pixels below. So I'll come over here and create a new layer. I'm gonna name this heel and clone and click OK. So we have this layer here. I'll hold control and zoom in with my mouse wheel. So let's say, for example, I want to get rid of this hair, but I don't want to paint directly on the layer with the model. With that sample merged option checked, even though I'm on the heel and clone layer, it's going to grab pixels from the layer below. So I'll hold control and click, and that's going to grab a source area. And now when I paint on my destination area, and I'm gonna just click and grab multiple source areas here as I go. So it's performing the usual task it would perform with the heel tool. It's using an algorithm to clone an area and then use pixels from the surrounding destination area to blend it all together and create a convincing final result here so it looks like there was nothing ever here. Hold control and zoom out. So you can see that little strand of hair is gone. And if I hide this layer, you can see that all of those changes were made directly on this heel and clone layer. So I'll unhide that 
So that's a handy new feature in the heel tool. It's in the clone tool as well, and it's actually been in the clone tool for a while, but it never actually worked. So if I scroll down here, you'll see we still have the sample merged option for the clone tool. The main difference being that now that option actually works. In GIMP 2.10.8, that option didn't work. So I'll hold control and zoom in, and I will hold control and click to grab a source area. And then I'll just paint on the destination area and you can see it's cloning over that strand of hair and it's on this heel and clone layer. So there's a before, there's an after. I'll hit Control Z to undo that. And I'll hold Control and use my mouse wheel to zoom out. So the next new feature found in GIMP 2.10.10 is an improvement made to the brushes. Most notably the fact that parametric brushes are now 32-bit float. So for those of you who have no idea what that means, basically if I come over here to my brushes dock, You'll see we have a series of brushes here. These are your normal brushes. And all the brushes, by the way, have little icons in the corner. And if it has a plus icon, that means the brush head is actually larger than it appears here in the preview. If it has a little red icon, that means it's an animated brush. So if I click and hold that brush, it'll animate it. And I can show you one more example here. So if I click on it, you can see this brush is also animated. But then there's a brush type called parametric brushes, and that basically means it's a custom brush that you set your own parameters to. So to create a parametric brush, you come down here and click create a new brush. And that'll bring up a new brush here with whatever settings you want to put here. I'm not going to spend too much time creating a brand new brush. But here I'm just creating some random parameters. And then I can name this parametric brush 2 because I created one earlier. And now you can see I've got this new star brush. So this is a custom brush and I'm using the clone tool with this brush. I'll hit Control Z to undo that and I'll switch over to my normal brush. So this parametric brush now supports 32-bit float, which means it's going to be a higher precision in terms of the bit depth or in terms of the colors and the shades of gray it can support. So the reason the GIMP team added this was to cut down on something called posterization. And that is when you have basically a limited number of colors available or a limited number of shades of gray available. And so instead of displaying those colors accurately, your, uh, in this case, your GIMP is going to cheat and it's going to create posterization, which is going to be a essentially a simplified version of that color transition or of that shading transition. So now it's going to more accurately display those transitions, which means for you guys, higher quality brushes, better colors, more colors, and better shading, more shades of gray. An important note about this feature is that it only applies to the parametric brushes. It does not apply to the rest of the brushes in GIMP. So all the brushes that are in your brush dock by default are not going to have the 32-bit precision. They're still going to have the 8-bit precision. Also, the plugins that you use that are going to want to utilize your brushes are also only going to be able to use the 8-bit brushes. So sticking with our brushes here, there was also an update made to brushes you copy to your clipboard. So let me demonstrate by coming back over here to our Illustrator composition and I'm going to hide the GIMP Wilbur logo and I'm going to bring up our original sketch layer and hide the second sketch layer that I made. So here was the original terrible sketch layer that I filled in with the smart colorization feature and now I'm just going to scale this. I'll go to image, scale image and I'm just going to scale this down to 100 pixels and hit the tab key and I'll hit scale. So now we're zoomed in 100% and what I want to do is I want to make this illustration of Wilbur a brush and to do that I'm going to come over here and click on that Wilbur sketch layer and now I'm going to hit Control C on my keyboard and if I come down here to the brushes dock you'll see that that illustration is now a custom brush. So before this was only going to be temporary data and you couldn't create a new brush from it but now in GIMP 2.10.10 I can come over here and duplicate this brush and that will now save this as a custom brush, so that makes it stored data. And if I click and hold this, you can see I get a preview there. Of course, I can come down here and delete this brush and hit delete again to remove it. One last new feature I want to cover in regards to the brushes is the fact that I can open a brush as an image and this allows me to more easily edit a brush and so let me show you an example here. This brush right here was a parametric brush I created earlier. It's not actually going to work for this brush so let me come over here to another brush and right click and you can see that some of the brush types are going to have open brush as image options so I'll click on that and now that's going to open up our brush right here in GIMP. So for example, I could increase the size of my brush here, paint some random stuff here, and now I can control C to copy that. And now that edited brush is over here in my clipboard. I can click on that, come over here and duplicate it, 
And now I've got a brand new brush created from the original brush here. So that new feature just allows you to easily edit or manipulate your brushes in GIMP. We'll move on now to a new feature that was added to some of the blur filters. So I'm gonna come over here to another image and now I'll come over to my layers panel and I'm going to click on my original girl layer here. I don't wanna click on the heel and clone layer. Then I'll come over to filters, blur, circular motion blur. So everything looks pretty much the same here in the circular motion blur, except for these two lines right here in the middle. And they pretty much resemble the lines you get when you use the on canvas gradient feature. These lines are called simple lines and I'm gonna hold control and zoom back out. And these simple lines allow you to make adjustments to the circular motion blur simply by clicking and dragging the lines. So you can see that as I do this, there are different parameters changing for this circular motion blur. So right now the angle is changing, but I can also change the center X and Y by dragging this other endpoint here. So you can see that as I drag this, both the angle and the center X and Y coordinates are changing there. So you can definitely do a bunch of crazy things with this. I'm gonna move this back into place to about right there, decrease the angle on this, and then if I click OK, it'll go ahead and apply that transformation. This new feature was also added to the linear blur and the zoom motion blur, so I can access those by going to filters, blur, and here you have the linear motion blur, and then here you have the zoom motion blur. So all three of these motion blurs got that new feature. There's also been several performance improvements made to Gaggle and Babel found in GIMP. So a lot of that is going to be some back end stuff, but what that means on the front end or the side of GIMP that we all see is that GIMP is going to perform a little bit faster than we're used to. You guys may remember that in a lot of my photo editing tutorials, I start with scaling the image down so that it's easier to work with in GIMP. Well, the reason for that mostly is because GIMP can tend to be pretty slow, especially when you have a very very large image. Well, one thing you'll notice now in GIMP with these performance improvements is that it can pretty much handle making image adjustments or edits to your images without scaling the image down. So that allows you to keep those high quality images without having to lose quality by scaling it. And for those of you who cannot scale your images, it's going to allow you to save time by not having to sit there and wait for adjustments to take effect. So outside of this more obvious improvement, there's also been improvements made to the exporting or saving of your files. So for example, if you're trying to save your file to an XCF and an error occurs during the saving process, what it used to do is it would overwrite your good XCF file with that XCF file that contained an error. Well, they've gone ahead and fixed that problem so that if there is an error, it's not gonna save over your good file. And this isn't something that I have firsthand experience with. I've never had a corrupted XCF file save over a good one. So for those of you out there who have experienced this, they have gone ahead and fixed that. And sticking with the performance improvements, they've also improved the rendering of layer groups. So if I come over here and go to File, Open Recent, and I click on my isometric building composition, it loads pretty quickly there. And I do have a bunch of layer groups in here, so instead of these taking forever to render, they all render much more quickly, and that just speeds up the overall performance of GIMP. And I know this composition probably isn't that large and doesn't contain that many layer groups compared to other really large compositions, such as those found in things like the Zimarmit project. And I know that they are a big reason why a lot of these changes are being implemented into GIMP. And so big shout out to them, big thanks to them. You know, regular users like you and I get to basically benefit from these changes because now GIMP is just going to perform faster overall, even if the projects aren't quite as large. There's also been some updates made for Mac users, including a crucial update, which includes a signature that is going to come with the download package for GIMP. Some of you have had issues with when you download GIMP, you get an error message from Mac or basically a security alert saying that the publisher is not recognized. Now GIMP has that official signature, so Mac should recognize the publisher. Additionally, there's been a fix to blurry icons. Apparently there were blurry icons found in the Mac version. I use the Windows version, so this isn't something that I noticed but they have improved the high DPI slash retina support for the Mac edition of GIMP, and that should help fix those problems. 
For those of you into game design, GIMP now natively supports DDS files, and so those are basically texture files. Again, these are gonna be used by people in game design who wanna add textures to things. In total, there's been 41 bug fixes made to GIMP since 2.10.8, and that has improved the speed and the safety of GIMP. Plus, there's been 66 commits to Babel and over 400 commits to Gaggle, further improving the performance and the robustness of the back end of GIMP, and this is just going to make GIMP more competitive with big time programs in the future. Plus there's been over 21 translations added with GIMP 2.10.10 so this also helps to make GIMP more accessible around the world. All right guys that's it for this tutorial. Hopefully you liked it. If you did please subscribe to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Davies Media Design. You can visit our website at DaviesMediaDesign.com. You can enroll in my best-selling GIMP 2.10 Masterclass from beginner to pro photo editing on Udemy. And you can support our channel and help us grow by becoming a patron on Patreon. And I'll include a link to that as well as all the relevant links from this tutorial in the description of the video. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.